I'm Abigail Noir, I'm Inuk, and this is my community, Bakery. I grew up here and I lived here till I was 22. I first moved to Ottawa when I was 22 for post-secondary education. But Abigail says it was not only education that drove her south, but also the drastically inflated costs of food. Today in Ottawa, Abigail is struggling to support herself and her three-month-old son, Thomas. When I was last home in August 2011, I had gone to a convenience store down the road and um, it just for two sandwiches, two bags of beef jerky, two drinks and two chocolate bars, that was $60. Abigail blames the high cost of food on changes in the Inuit culture. Before, the Inuit lived off the land, but that has now changed due to a reliance on imported goods and technology. A lot of programs in the Inuit communities that try to tackle the food insecurity situation. Uh, Nutrition North, for example, is a subsidy program that uh, subsidizes nutritious food to make them more accessible to people in isolated northern communities. Uh, as you mentioned, community freezers, uh, there's greenhouses and uh, country food markets. But despite these initiatives, many Inuit in both the North and South continue to struggle to make the transition from their traditional ways of life into a more modern culture. Abigail embodies this culture gap. With the government, like, they wanted us to integrate into their, the Western society and, like, they had to go to school to adapt to the rest of Canada. And we, from doing that, like, we lost our hunting skills. So it's, there's a huge gap in terms of, like, our cultural ways. There's a saying where we went from igloos to microwaves, like in a matter of years, like a matter of 50 years. It's shocking to think that in Canada, everyday food items such as milk, sugar and cereal can cost more than $10 each, more than double their regular southern prices. And in Nunavut, where Abigail is from, approximately 70% of the Inuit community are food insecure. A UN report released in early March emphasizes how up to 4 million Canadian citizens, citizens like Abigail, are food insecure, struggling to feed not only themselves, but their families as well. But the Canadian government has refuted these claims in an official response to the report, saying they're actively working on the issue. They also criticized the report's author for not even visiting Northern Canada, one of the most food insecure regions in the country. Since graduating from her program, Abigail has struggled to find work in Ottawa, and she now also has a three-month-old son to feed. Up north, I feel like I, I would have more chances of being employed with administrative skills. Um, so that's where I'm at right now. Like, I'm raising my baby, um, and I'm currently unemployed. Abigail says she's now caught in a catch-22 situation. She can't find work here in Ottawa, and she can't afford to move back to Baker Lake, where she could find work. I'm, tr I'm feeling trapped, where I would like to move back home, but that would require me asking for financial assistance to go home, where I'm not exactly certain where I could go for that financial assistance. Jason LeBlanc, executive director of an Ottawa-based Inuit community centre, confirms that food insecurity and the high prices of food are one of the main reasons why people like Abigail flee southwards. But he says that this move can actually trigger a domino effect of exponentially worsening conditions for them. Sometimes the urgency of that sort of situation, the urgency a family faces when they're food insecure, it does tend to create circumstances where they may move a bit hastily. They may make a, a decision to move as a response to that negative situation in their current environment, their lack of affordable or adequate food. And when people do things in that manner, sometimes they don't have the best preparation or they're not prepared to succeed the best way possible. And they wind up moving south with maybe not a really thought out plan or a way of uh, 
developing themselves in the southern city and then that kind of creates another level of, of frustration for them as they start to have to rebuild. LeBlanc says many Inuit end up getting stranded in the south. It's a real challenge uh, for the, some of the reasons that you cited, the, the cost of airfare alone, the lack of appropriate housing or affordable housing in the north and uh, you see people who wind up staying in the south for 15 or 20 years and it seems like every other year they intend to move north but all the factors involved uh, prevent them from doing so. But thankfully LeBlanc's organization provides a number of services for the Inuit community in Ottawa including a weekly food bank. Abigail takes full advantage of the program to address her own family's food insecurity. And Abigail also benefits from other free Aboriginal programs, such as the swimming class for new mums, to ensure that she and Thomas maintain a healthy lifestyle. LeBlanc says that Abigail's newborn son Thomas is representative of an emerging demographic statistic in Canada. So our community is the youngest and fastest growing segment of the Canadian population. Uh, even among Aboriginal uh, groups, Inuit are at the forefront of that. So what that creates for us is a very uh, young and, and dynamic uh, age group to work with, but it also presents some challenges because we have to infuse a lot of um, value and a lot of education and a lot of awareness. LeBlanc says that his organization is therefore doing its best to ensure that one generation's decision to migrate south doesn't create a pernicious ripple effect that will also affect Thomas's generation. But for now, Abigail says with the help from LeBlanc's organization, she's just keeping her head above water. With these resources, like, I am able to get by. And it's hard to say. Like, I have no idea where I would be without them. For 25th Hour, I'm Mark Ellison.